Good morning, Strasburg United Methodist Church and all others who have found us online on Facebook or YouTube. We welcome you to worship. And if you're here in town, we invite you to come to worship at 8 o'clock, 9.30, or 11 a.m. There are a lot of amazing things that we've been doing here this fall. Uh, yesterday, we were part of the Strasburg Harvest Festival down at the town park. Uh, today, uh, we're having a potluck. It's also Back to Church Sunday, so we're asking people to, to come. Next Saturday, our youth group is going to be going bowling as we try to get that started again. And next Sunday, we are having a Relay for Life event in the afternoon to help raise money for cancer research. So those are just a few of the things that are happening, and we invite you to the many more th things that are going on. You can check out our website or newsletter. Will you join me as we open our worship with prayer today? You hear the cries of your people for justice and mercy. You answer our prayers with the gift of your Son, who bears our burdens and sets us free. Speak your truth to us. Purge and refine us, that we may love and serve you alone. Amen. Rich Gers has prepared some music for you today. I hope that it brings you joy. Well, I never made a fortune And it's probably too late now But I don't worry about that much Because I'm happy anyhow And as I go along life's journey I'm reaping better than I sowed Drinking from my saucer Because my cup is overflowed I ain't got a lot of riches And sometimes the going's tough But I've got kids who love me That makes me rich enough I just thank God for his blessings And the mercies he's bestowed I'm drinking from my saucer Because my cup is overflowing And if God gives me his courage When the way grows deep and rough I'll not ask for another blessing I'm already blessed enough May I never be too busy Help another bear his load I'll keep drinking from my saucer Because my cup is overflowed I'll keep drinking from my saucer Because my cup is overflowed Our mission moment is not much about mission and, and the work that we do, but rather I just wanted to share with you the BUMC campaign that um, has been started by our United Methodist Board of Communications uh, to remind us that we are connected to one another. It's also National Back to Church Sunday, and we ask that you consider coming back to worship in person. There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, serve, learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. 
We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC. Will you join me in prayer as we offer prayers for the world? Holy One, you are beyond our imagining, beyond our control beyond our comfort. You will not be bound by our schemes. Even so, we maintain appearances and we jockey with our neighbors even as we make idols from our fears. But your ways are not our ways. You are not a God of tidy balance sheets or weekly appointments. Your love is too deep. Your claim, too pervasive. You are there when tempers fray and anger erupts. You are there when anxiety overwhelms and we withdraw. You are here in every bruised heart, every calloused hand, every tangled dream. Move among us now. Hear our prayers. Receive our broken spirits as the offerings we bring this day. Merciful God, breathe deeply into this room your reconciling love your holy expectation, allow us to see the faces of those we have harmed and those we have kept at a distance. Work in us, Lord, until our hearts are softened and we dare to seek our neighbor's good. Teach us to pray with our hands and our feet and our voices. Move among us now. Hear our prayers. We lift to you now all that seems irreconcilable in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our nation, in your church, in your world. We pray for those we identify as leaders in every sphere of life. We pray for our president and for all whose decisions weigh heavily on others. Move among us now. Hear our prayers. Even so, Lord, give us the courage to name ourselves as those whose responsibility is great. Teach us to tend the world you love, to sow more than we reap, to heal more than we wound, to make room for others as you made room for us. We pray with hearts, both eager and reluctant, trusting that you will meet us and call to us just where we are. In the name of Christ. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Will you join with me now as we pray our prayer of thanksgiving? Who is like you, O Lord our God? You look with mercy upon the earth. You lift up the poor from the dust and give them a place at your table. Teach us to sing your praise forever and to show your love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Will you join with me now in our prayer for illumination as we ready our hearts to hear Scripture today? God of life, by the power of your Spirit, come to us now. Plow our hearts with your living word, until we who are broken become fertile with your love. For we long to bear fruit in a world that is wasting. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose charge we bear. Amen. Our lesson from the gospel comes today from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an account of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What shall I do now, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager... People may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Many of you in our community know Reverend Bill Arbach, who has preached at many churches throughout the valley following a career as a military chaplain. I was speaking with someone who used to attend one of the churches he served, and she recalled that her favorite sermon of his was one called the dash. Now, the dash refers to that symbol we put in between two numbers, the birth year and the death year. We, we see the dash all the time on tombstones, on obituaries mostly, but also next to names on artwork or songs or poems and biographies as we recall the works of art left behind by the creative people of this world. That dash contains the sum total of our life, all of our memories, our relationships, even our worldly goods. I've been thinking about that dash recently as our church has faced the loss of many members and friends over the last few months. As I've met with family members and engaged in the intimacy required to cobble together a eulogy for a funeral, I've heard snippets of life that matter to the people who are left behind. And I have to tell you, what matters for families and what is remembered at funerals is so different 
from how most of us live our lives. For all of us here, that dash is what we're experiencing right now. It starts with our birthday, and then the dash is just there, waiting for the moment of leaving this world. I was thinking about that dash as I read Luke 16 this week. We've been hearing a lot from Luke this year. And one thing we learn is that his understanding of Jesus is always concerned with the gap between the rich and the poor, the powerful and the weak, those who have and those who don't have. Luke introduced us to that theme of the life of Jesus in the words of Mary when she sings her song in response to the angel Gabriel and speaks longingly of the time when the oppression of the powerful is overthrown by God. And so we shouldn't be surprised when Jesus tells us parables about wealth and privilege. Of course, these words from Luke chapter 16 don't make a whole lot of sense. Unless we carefully hear this parable, we may think that Jesus is telling us to be like the dishonest manager, doing what we must to make sure that we land on our feet no matter what. We have to remember the world that Jesus was living in. The wealthy were universally corrupt and cruel. Taxation of the poor was as high as 100%, especially since generational slavery was normalized. The poor could not easily escape their condition. The idea of pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps was not a saying in biblical times. In this parable, we discover that a rich man is about to fire a manager simply because he heard that the man was cheating him. you got to remember, there is no evidence, just hearsay and gossip. And the manager, being told that he is about to be fired, goes out to all the people who owe the rich man money and doesn't just cheat a little. He cheats a lot. He knows that by cutting the debt owed by others to the rich man, that he has built himself some goodwill with all of those people, thus being able to avoid having to work hard or to beg. Now, you got to remember also that the people who owe the rich man still believe the manager is employed. So the manager is creating a new contract between the rich man and the borrowers. The borrowers are not acting unethically. Only the manager is. Now, the rich man... Seeing all that has happened, commends the manager's shrewdness, uh, but still fires the corrupt manager. And if wealth and comfort is your only goal in life, Jesus seems to say that perhaps we need to live in ways that seem corrupt to others. Certainly those who are devious in this life know how to deal with the corrupt systems of wealth and power, and maybe we should learn from them. But that's not the point of the parable. Jesus says that the children of light, that is, believers, don't know how to be devious. Jesus continues teaching us that those who are dishonest in a little are also dishonest in much, and those who are trustworthy with a little are also trustworthy in much. This is where I get back to the idea of the dash. I recently was speaking to someone who left the corporate world and has had a born-again experience. When I asked him what changed, he told me that he had finally worked long enough in his profession and got to a point where work was no longer the metric used to measure his salary. Instead, he was now asked to cut corners on contracts, to manipulate clients, and to engage in unethical methods to make money for the company. He said he saw how the sausage was made and could no longer work at the sausage factory. Instead, he wanted to live as a child of the light. Now, I don't think this is a a universal experience for workers in the corporate world and corporate life in America, but but I've heard stories like this in other fields such as higher education and healthcare and government contracting and commercial businesses. And I know that sometimes ethics is an optional continuing education class instead of a guiding principle in many areas of careers and work life for people. Inevitably, when I speak to families and friends at the time of a funeral, I do not hear much about the working life of a person. 
At most, I learned the dates. Of course, with the dashes in between of when they started and ended a career. What matters more is the character of the person who lived this life. Are you somebody who is trustworthy in your marriage? Are you somebody who loved your children? Did you treat strangers with kindness and generosity? Did you live out the lessons of faith on a daily basis? Did your belief inform your actions? Were you loved? And did you love? Now, the truth is, even people who do not have faith can lead good lives. There are a lot of great people in the world. So let me put a Christian spin on all of this. We believe in eternity. That date we put at the end of an obituary or in the brackets after our name on a piece of creative work or on our tombstones is not the end. As Christians, we believe that that date of death is the date of our graduation, a date where we live the eternal life with God. The time before our death is continuing education for eternity. It is the practice of living as children of light. Our lives here on earth are the training days for our kingdom life. So yes, we can pursue wealth and fame and comfort. Many people do. That's what they choose to do in this life. And a very few people achieve a stupendous amount of money in a short time. We know their names and their fame, and somehow we think it matters. But what people remember about us is not how much money we had or how many homes we lived in or the work we did. No, they remember how we made them feel and whether we helped them be better people. Every child I know remembers the love that their parent gave them or wistfully talks about the love they wished they had from a parent. And what God measures is how we have lived to love God and to love our neighbors. In his final lesson from today's parable, Jesus tells us that we cannot serve two masters. We can't serve God and money. And the word is actually mammon, which can also be translated as material wealth or stuff. I actually think stuff is a better translation. You see, we can be slaves to the stuff we have, or we can be servants of God. And the truth is, the stuff we have is often a headache for those who we leave behind. So we're better off to be in the service of God, who loves us and teaches us to love others. Now, a quick internet search revealed to me that Reverend Erbach was not the first person to talk about the dash. In fact, there are many, many sermons online that talk about what we do between our birthday and the day of our death. There's even a book out there by a woman named Linda Ellis called Living the Dash, based on a poem that she wrote back in 1996. You may have heard her poem read at funerals, but I think it's worthy of sharing with all of you today. The Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted first came the date of the birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent life on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel, be less quick to anger and show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, 
would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever the lord be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace forever the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace.